Well, good afternoon, everybody. We love seeing this room packed with people who care about this issue, which is huge. And I want to introduce my wonderful panel, by the way, who I think can help solve all of our world's problems. Maybe not in one hour, but... Um, to my right, your left, to begin with, Simon Henshaw, who is Acting Assistant Secretary Bureau of Populations. This is so long. Mm -hmm. Refugees and Migration with the U.S. State Department. Thank you. And to my immediate right, your left, Peter Logharn, President and CEO of the Conrad Hilton Foundation. I also want you to meet Zainab Salbi, who is an author. She is a media commentator, and she's also the founder, among many other things, of Women for Women International. And next to her is Saeed Mujtahad, President of the Syrian Institute for Progress. And finally, Last but not least, Carol Stern, who is the president and CEO of UNICEF USA. So needless to say, these are people who have been immersed in the issue of the refugee crisis, all of them, for many years now. When you look at the situation today, we know that in 2015, five million Syrians fled the country. And probably the images that remain in all of our minds are those terrible and multiple images of refugees crossing the Mediterranean. A million people did that at tremendous peril. Many of them died. And, it, and not to mention the 300,000 refugees who fled across the Balkans on land to freedom or a better life as they were hoping. It was at that time that really the world focused its attention. It was like that wake up call not that we don't need more wake-up calls, but it was, hello, here is what's going on. Here is a desperate situation that is global, and it's something that we have to address. So that's what we're doing today. These are daunting statistics. We'll talk about that later. But I have asked our panel to, for a couple of minutes each, just to start with what their foundation, or in Simon's case, the U.S. government, is doing what how their approach is going forward in trying to help solve this gargantuan problem that we have so Simon if you would begin thank you Mary thanks everyone for being here I my friends like to joke the longer your title the less important your job is but <laughs> <laughs> it's just a joke uh, yeah. I, you know, the United States is a global leader in a, in a lot of ways, uh, economically, militarily, uh, diplomatically. But I think of uh, it's little known what a leader we are when it comes to humanitarian affairs. We have long played the largest humanitarian role in the world. We are the largest funder of humanitarian agencies. We are the largest funder of UNHCR, the High Commission for Refugees for the Palestinian Refugee uh, Association, UNRWA, for IOM, the Immigration of, uh, uh, the International Organization of Migration, for the International Committee of the Red Cross. We are the largest funder. We are out in the field. To, we are working with them. We are looking for new ways to deal with humanitarian crisis. In 2016, uh, the last fiscal year, 2016, the United States contributed more than $7 billion for humanitarian affairs, and that's straight humanitarian affairs. That's not some propaganda game or, or some neat little uh, uh, video op. That's serious money into NGOs and international organizations to deal directly with uh, humanitarian crisis around the world. We provide food, shelter, health care services, access to clean water, and urgent pavilions to millions of people. Even more importantly to me, perhaps because of my 32 years in the diplomatic services, we play a huge role in humanitarian diplomacy. We work with other countries to get them to donate money as well. We work with other institutions to improve what they do so that the care that's given is better. We work with countries that host refugees to help them host the refugees and often change their policies to make them better for the refugee communities. Uh, and just two examples we, I, I want to give where, where we've shown a lot of effort in bringing innovation to refugee work. First of all, though a lot of people have the image of refugees in camps, over 60% of the world's refugees do not live in camps. They live in poor sections of cities and towns in the countries to which they fled. So we've worked with UNHCR and other organizations to change the way that aid is given so it takes into account that people aren't sitting in camps, but they're spread around the city. 
How do you get aid to them? How do you, get, how do you give them services? How do you connect them to local hospitals instead of giving them direct? Uh, direct health care. All these things we've been on the forefront of. We are on the forefront of a program called Safe from the Start, which is dealing with uh, gender-based violence, which is a polite way of saying rape and abuse, to, uh, particularly to women. In the past, uh, international organizations only reacted once these violent acts happened. We've worked them, with them to change their policies so they, that they get ready and assume and prevent cases ahead of time. And, just for a quick example, I, I can't tell you how many attacks lighting latrine areas or putting locks on latrines prevent. Just simple things like that, changing the way that things operate can help prevent attacks and save, save lots of people from various horrors. Simon, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say he's going to answer all of these questions, mm -hmm. and I'd like to move on to, okay. uh, to Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Because Mary. the scope of what mm -hmm. the government, what our State Department is mm -hmm. doing is vast and impressive. Um, but I'd like to hear now about the Conrad Hilton Foundation. And I think I can make up some of Simon's time because we're less than 1% of what the U.S. government puts into this. Uh, <laughs> but still yeah, helping. But immensely. very important. We're, we're an L.A.-based foundation. We do about half of our work domestically, half internationally. We started in crisis response working on natural disasters. But frankly, the, the, the scope of the refugee issue really uh, caused us to move into support uh, for refugees uh, about five years ago. We've put about six million dollars into Syrian refugees. We're proud supporters of the International Medical Corps, uh, International Rescue Committee, uh, Save the Children, uh, and we also have a two million dollar annual humanitarian prize. Uh, our director is here, uh, and we're, we look each year at the future of humanitarian action. Last year, um, a, a deep look into how could the system be improved. Uh, let me speak just briefly about philanthropy in general. We put in about $300 million to a $25 billion annual industry. So that's about 1%. But I like to think that we are, our funding is flexible, it's generative, it's catalytic, it's long-term. So I'll come back to what I think some opportunities are for that. Terrific. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Zainab, you have been involved uh, in humanitarian issues for many, many years on different fronts. Uh, please tell us two minutes worth <laughs> of uh, where, you, where you are going with that. Well, as I was thinking about today, I mean, I have been involved for 25 years and some people here mm -hmm. more, and I feel that the story is exactly the same. It has not changed, you know, and this, the, if, if it anything, the story of refugees, the refugee issues has gotten worse in my opinion. And, you know, one of the stories that sort of, of all the stories that I've worked with, and people always say, you know, I founded Women Forum International, I run it for 18 years, and then the, the last few years I'm more featuring stories of refugees uh, in media. And the one story that for me is resembling the, the crisis that we are in today is of an Iraqi Yazidi man who owned five stores in his hometown, had a family, has a family, seven kids, all of these things. ISIS comes. He doesn't believe that they are coming. So he was one of the last people to sort of escape from his hometown. He, he just bought a pickup truck. He puts all of his family in the pickup truck, 21 members, his brother, his, his kid, the kids, all of these things, and his wife and his mom is in front of him, with him in the front seat. And he is chasing literally one of the last people getting out of his hometown, and ISIS caught him. And they start chasing him in a car chase with machine guns fighting at him and all the kids and the family are like, you know, uh, lowering their bodies so they don't get hit. And in the process of the chase, he goes through a pothole. Mm -hmm. And in the pothole, the ca car is driving fast. His four years old daughter is thrown out of the pickup mm -hmm. truck. Now he's telling me, he says, he look, he is seeing in the rear view mirror that this has just happened. And he sees ISIS car with their machine guns around them after them. And he has to make a decision whether he stops and save the daughter and ISIS will catch up to him and kill the whole family, or whether he keeps on going and save 21 members of the family, but leave the daughter. I say the story because that is the crisis. It's no longer about humanitarian crisis. This is not about only feeding this man. This is about taking um, a man who had five stores, a small business owner, I would say, 
small to medium business owner with integrity, a good father, all of that, taking his dignity away because he, was, um, he could not protect his children anymore. So I go, I'm caught obviously by the story and I follow up with him. I've known him for two years now. I've done two stories on him, all of these things. I go visit him a few months ago in Iraq. He's living in a refugee camp. He's an internally displaced person. In other words, he is no longer in his home, but he is a refugee in his own country, basically. He, um, he is eating every day with the rest of the family, but he doesn't have a job. They rotate jobs where every six months, one man is giving a job and earns an income for one day. So his daughter is taken away from him. He's a refugee in her camp. He doesn't have a job for every six months. He has one day of income. He wants to leave the country. He says, I don't want to live in a country that no longer protects me, that cannot protect me. So he wants to leave the country. He sells the pickup truck. He escapes to Turkey as an illegal refugee, but then he hears ISIS was uh, withdrawn from the area where he left his daughter. So the whole family comes to search for remains of the daughter and they can't find anything. And I'm begging this guy. Now, this is a very real case, but it symbolized everything. It symbolized the dignity, the humanitarian crisis, the refugee crisis. It symbolized the whole need to escape out of the country. And he goes back to the country. He runs out of money. He cannot leave. Now, I'm trying to convince him to stay in the country and not be an illegal refugee because I understand the consequences of him going to be illegal in Turkey and then make their fight to all the, the rather the journey to Europe. It's a horrible journey. And he's like, and it's and trying to find him a refugee status, impossible. No country wants to, make, to take any more refugees. Trying to convince this man to stay in the country and he is like barely staying in the country. And that's the crisis we need. We can t I don't mean to tell a story, nor do I want to talk about only how good our work is, because it's all good. But there is a wake-up call. If the story keeps on repeating itself, this for me, this guy is a Sophie's choice, mm -hmm. you know, which we now learn about it in movies and we are empathetic. This is a crisis that is not only their crisis, not only about the other. The other is coming to, to this country, to Europe, to all of that. We need to have a really different way of looking at it. A way, this is a wake-up call of no longer doing things the way we used to do and no longer the same discussions about repeating numbers and how horrible it is. But this is about our own survival, all of us as humanity, in my opinion. Because he is no longer, I can convince him to stay in Iraq for a few more, but at this point, people are saying, I don't want to wait for anybody. And I'm going to impose myself on another country because I can't wait anymore. Thank you, Zainab. Now, Saeed. All right. Um, I want to thank the uh, Milken Institute for putting this uh, subject on its program. And I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's really important. I uh, appreciate your interest in the refugee, especially that now, uh, you know, thinking about refugee, Syrian refugee comes to most people's mind. And this story that I just heard, remember, you have 13 million uh, refugee Syrian that share similar story to this. Um, we started the Syrian Institute for Progress early on uh, of 2012. Uh, can you imagine in 2012 there was only 100,000 refugee only, Syrian refugee. Uh, in 2013, one and a half million. Today, you have five million. So you can imagine the escalation of, of numbers. So when we started, the refugee were uh, just people flooding their home, no, nothing organized. And I went actually in 2012 inside Syria to visit them at the border with Turkey. There were no tents. They were living under the olive trees. Uh, you see many cars and people, you know, uh, the children in the car and the parents outside. So we started the institute to help them out. So we were mostly, we, we like to uh, see ourselves as the voice of the, ref, of the Syrian refugee in America. So uh, many trips to DC talking about my two visits, what's been happening. And uh, I went to one shelters. It hosted several thousands. And I went to the medical area where truly the pharmacy there 
perhaps I have more uh, drugs in my house than what I saw at that pharmacy. It's really horrible things. So then the crisis became uh, quite a bit larger than any country to handle. So I wanted to kind of somehow focus at an area where we can make a difference. So then we uh, formed uh, or we spinned off the Burn Children Relief Foundations where we bring Syrian children who are burned severely only on those cases that cannot be treated within the region, we bring them to the United States. That program has been truly successful for, of course, the donors, but certainly for the Shriners Hospital that been very, very supportive in treating them free of charge. Our portion is just the cost of bringing them here and, and living, etc. And of course, those treatment goes anywhere between six months to perhaps two years, it depends on the injury. But equally so, uh, if it hasn't been for the outstanding support from our U.S. State Department to grant them visa even without having a passport, that program would never take off. So uh, uh, with that, uh, this is what we've uh, been focusing on the uh, burned children. Uh, recently, as uh, in, we are based in California, as we start receiving refugees here in uh, Southern California, uh, we noticed that the refugee comes, they have a honeymoon maybe for a week or so, but then the money starts drying out. They try to get into the system, they need driver license, etc. I mean, there's not, nobody to help. So therefore, uh, the community at various portions, they came to help out, which we're very thankful to. But we thought, what can we do beyond just providing them the help? You want to help them to stand up on their feet and start being productive rather than just receiving uh, you know, the support. And remember, the, uh, the allowance will run out, I think, anywhere between four to six months in terms of their living expense and apartment, et cetera. So we recently formed a group of uh, volunteers that are professionals where they will meet with the refugees interview them, identify the particular skills, and to try to help them out to more train within the American system so they can either uh, be able to get uh, a job or perhaps if they have an inter inter um, entrepreneurship, then we can help them out to open their small businesses. So that's what we do at the Institute. Thank you, Saeed. Thank you. And Carol, you, um, your story is unique also because yes you have been heading up UNICEF USA for a number of years but you grew up in a refugee household please tell us just a little bit about that and then of course UNICEF as well sure it's wonderful to go last because I can echo some of what all of you said um, my mom was a child refugee she came to this country at the age of six with her brother who was four with neither their mother nor their father, but with a woman whom they've never, they never saw again, and who placed them in an orphanage on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And her mother had to make that ultimate choice. The only way to save her children was to send them away. And so I grew up in a house where I heard that story repeatedly. And my grandfather was on the boat, the SS St. Louis, the voyage of the dam that was not allowed to dock anywhere. And so as a child, I would repeatedly ask, so where was the world? You know, how could a mommy send her kids away? Why would people let that happen? What do you mean no country would let my grandfather in? You know, he was a man. He, he wasn't a pet. And um, she would say to me as a young child, well, a lot of people claimed they didn't know. But we do know. We're not only reading it. We're watching it on TV. We're bearing witness to it online. We hear stories like we've just heard. UNICEF works in 190 countries and territories. There are 50 million children on the move right now. 50 million kids. 28 million of them have been forcibly removed from their homes. And they are sleeping on rocks tonight. They are not being tucked into warm beds. And we are grown-ups. Kids do not get to pick where they're born. They wouldn't pick a war zone. They wouldn't pick poverty. They surely wouldn't pick being forced from their homes. And they have no politics. They are the most vulnerable victims in this crisis right now. And we are grown-ups, and we do know what's going on. You know, I was quite struck, Zainab, with what you said by it's repeating itself. And we need to do it differently this time. 
um, and also struck by the story you told, I think the thing that got me the most of all of the refugee camps I've worked in, and my dear friend got us with me, she was with me when we met this man who was an attorney with a very successful law practice inside of Syria. And then his home was blown up, and his wife was killed, and his daughter was injured, and nobody would help them. And he literally put a 12-year-old on his shoulder, and he walked to Jordan. And he got her into a hospital until his money ran out. And then he suddenly realized he had no more money. He had, he had no home left. His credit cards were useless. The bank accounts were gone. And there but for the grace of God go any of us. And he wanted us to understand what his life had been. And he kept smacking his hand. He kept saying, I had a car. I had a house. My children had laptops. He must have said, my children had laptops to me 20 times. Well, I have a house, and I have a car, and my children have laptops. And there but for the grace of God. And I was so struck by it. And then he told me the piece that Zainab, your story reminded me of. He said, and now we live in a tent. And there are nine of us. And I thought he would tell me about the horror of the tent for himself. And he said, and my 12-year-old. At night, this was early on in the camps. There are lights now. But at the time, there were no lights outside the tents. And he said, and my 12-year-old, I'm afraid to let her go out at night if she needs to use the latrine. So she has to pee in the corner in front of the other eight people in the tent. And he said, and it's her loss of dignity that I don't know how I will ever repair. So UNICEF works to ensure that kids get a childhood. We build child-friendly spaces in the camps, places where only kids are allowed, where they play games, where they sing songs, where they remember that they're kids, where a group of 10-year-old girls that I met with when I said, what do you want to talk about, wanted to tell me about the boys that are living on the other side of the camp. <laughs> you know, it's a place where a kid gets to be a kid, but we're also building schools because there is an entire generation of kids who are getting lost in this crisis. I'm being told to move my scarf, so I need to do that. That better? <laughs> OK, sorry. Um, that are getting lost in this crisis. And if we don't educate them now, we will pay for that later. And so it is imperative. And this is not just a Syrian crisis. This is 190 countries around the world with kids who are being forced out of homes. Carol, thank you very much. And I know Zainab, um, well, as, as you see, each one of these individuals can put a specific face on what it means a specific horrible face on what it means to be a refugee. And like Carol just said, it's not just a Syrian refugee crisis. And I know, Zainab, you wanted to follow up on something well, Carol I just said. Absolutely, because majority of refugees are women and children. You know, 90% of these are, again, the statistics don't change. This is what's so frustrating for someone, I'm sure for all of us, because you keep on working on the exact same issue. It doesn't change. So 90% of refugees are civilians, 75% of which are women and children. The reason he's afraid to get his daughter out at night to use the bathroom is because usually these refugees, the camps are designed where the bathroom is far away from the tent. So a lot of violence happens within the camps themselves. And so the whole, it's, it's just a one bad story after the other. And I we're going to talk about the hope and optimism, of course. But the idea is that it's stripping them from dignity. These are design issues. Where do you put, where do you put the toilets? Where, these are design issues that is actually in the hands of people in this room and in, in this part of the world. How do you distribute hygiene items for women? How are you aware that they are majority of refugees are women and girls? You know, that we need to design programs around their needs. That, you know, and there is an awareness and there is a discussion, and yet... It's, and yet it's the same story, you know, that generates that father's concern. Mm -hmm. So that leads to the loaded question of what is our responsibility in the world? I think it says in the subtitle, our moral responsibility to help save these people. And how do we juxtapose that with what I think is such a negative thing and why I'm so happy to be sitting here with the five of you and that is putting that human face to it because I look at the press in our country and I see that it's not that we're demonizing we are certainly dehumanizing refugees and people are so fearful yes there have been the terrorist attacks 
in many, many places in Europe and here too. But should that stop us from helping these people who are really human beings like we are? And with that, Simon, I, I want to go back to you because if you could take us through what the traditional solution has been with resettlement, what the hope of that is for these people today. And uh, both you and Peter are looking at new ways, as, as everyone is, to help find a solution or certainly to better the situation. Yeah, well, the, the one solution is ending the wars and fighting. Mm -hmm. That's what we should all be concentrating on. I, I'm lucky as a humanitarian, I get to say, oh, I leave that to the political side of the house. I work on the other side. But the, the reality is we need to end, to the, end, to the, end the wars and let people go home. In the meantime, humanitarians do what they do uh, best, which is to try and take keep care of people until they can go home. And that's our number one solution, keeping people ready to go home. So that's why. Uh, the, number, the best solution, the first durable solution in the parlance, in refugee parlance, is for refugees to stay in the country of first asylum, keep them safe there, keep them fed, educated, and then ready to move back when the fighting ends. Problem is, fighting isn't ending. Second durable solution is for people to integrate in the countries to which they fled. Uh, that actually happens quite a bit, but it's a very difficult process. It takes a while for the country, accepting country, to adjust to the fact that these people aren't leaving like we thought. Uh, but it's, it happens in a lot of places eventually. The third durable solution is resettlement. Um, I know it's become a very hot political issue in the United States. There's been a lot of back and forth. I've, I've been stuck in the middle of it for much of the time. But in reality, no matter whether you're for or against it, it's always played a very little, small role in refugee work. Only 1% of refugees are resettled to third countries. Um, so the, it, it's, a, it's a great solution for the people that get that. As you all, I, I'm sure you've heard uh, my colleagues and myself perhaps say, they're, they're the most tightly security cleared people of any, uh, any group that ever comes into the United States. It's a two-year process. But it's a small, still a small number, whether it's the, the 110,000 that President Obama wanted to bring in this year or the 50,000 that President Trump selects. It's still a tiny percentage of refugees overseas, and they're the people that we need to concentrate on and put most of our resources I, into. I think there's another thing mm -hmm. right along those lines that we have to underscore, and that is these people coming in have lost everything or who are hoping to come in to their first asylum or hopefully a third country that could be a destination mm -hmm. uh, short of resettling. But they don't have, in most cases, any kind of identification, which really makes it impossible to, one, get into most countries, mm -hmm. two, have job opportunities, and three, education and medical help. So where are we with that? Because well, the numbers just, you're talking about versus the tens of millions right. um, If are I so could small. just throw in that actually most refugees do have identification. That's a misnomer that's uh, not, not from you, but from a lot of other people that's sort of become thought as a fact. But 97% of the refugees we see in Turkey, for instance, have their identity documents with them. But what and, they and have is no work or no money or no food. Yeah. Uh, most countries don't allow refugees to work, so they can't even go out and work unless they do it illegally in the gray market. They often don't have access to schools. I, I think that we've made huge progress w with Syrian refugees in the countries surrounding them away from that, but it, it's, been a, it's been a real challenge. Well, yeah. I want to actually mm -hmm. mention something uh, in your first point. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation came up with a report, which is an average stay of a refugee in a camp Seven. used to be, you know, one year or two years so they can re get repatriated mm -hmm. to their countries. Now it's 18 years. Yeah. Right. No one goes back to their country after 18 years. I'm not a legally refugee, mm -hmm. but I came here with $400 in my pocket at one point in my life. Mm -hmm. You don't go back. Not when there is no investment in the country you come from. You know, it's, it's destroyed. And so we do have to change the way we shift how we look mm -hmm. at the treatment of refugees in mm -hmm. camps. Because if they're staying there for 18 years, that's a lifetime. Mm -hmm. 
And we have to understand the countries that they are settling in because you look at a country like Lebanon, which is the size of Los Angeles, and it took a million refugees. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine a million refugees mm -hmm. arriving in LA? And they did that because they expected the world to support their ability to support the refugees. And the world is not meeting that obligation. Mm -hmm. There was so much attention to this that I know 2016 was an important year for mm -hmm. the UN summit that happened in September, mm -hmm. not to mention other global gatherings to try to help address this issue. But from everything I'm seeing, it feels like a very typical bureaucracy, and that is outside of those basically 30 countries who are willing to take in refugees, out of the 100 and almost 200 countries who could they're very slow to respond. They have made commitments to take in more refugees and to put more resources mm -hmm. in. But we're talking about 2018. We're talking about so many more refugees and so many more people dying, potentially. So, uh, Well, not dying. I, I think that that's the one thing that we are able to do. We save a lot of lives. Uh, but I w absolutely, refugees are, are in horrible conditions everywhere in the world that just, that's that is what a refugee is. You've been driven from your home from nothing, so you start very low. You have to look at new ways to deal with it. You're absolutely right, and the way to deal with it is, first of all, most refugees aren't in camps, they're in, in cities and towns, mm -hmm. so you have to first get them employment rights. We've gone a long way in Turkey and, and uh, Jordan, for instance, in doing that. You have to get their kids in school. All, almost all Syrian kids are now in school in Jordan and Lebanon. That took a huge amount of work over the last three years. Those are the things that you have to focus mm -hmm. on. And Education those are hundreds and of thousands millions. of refugees. Millions. 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 Between yeah. those two countries is what I'm the talking three. about. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Peter, I know you mm -hmm. want yeah. to interject there. Yeah. I, I, let me first uh, review some of the bad news. And, and the longer term bad news, because we're focused on today the right now, uh -huh. I think we're headed into a century of dislocation. Uh, and okay. even if Syria and all the other political situations that are driving refugees right now are, are settled, we are headed into so much climate fragility and uh, economic and political fragility that we need to have a system that is resilient for, for the foreseeable future. And, and I think the, the good news is that it's actually a good moment to be thinking about this. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as a number of panelists have said, the situation has changed fundamentally since post-World War II when all this was set up. Right, mm -hmm. people, the refugees aren't in camps, 17, 18 year duration of stay. We need to rethink. But we have three very dynamic new leaders in the world. The, the UN Secretary General, the head of HCR, and the new CEO of the World Bank all have humanitarian backgrounds, all are business-like, all want to see the system work better. Uh, you know, we think, uh, I said it's a $25 billion industry. That sounds big. But think of the market cap in this room. You're more than $25 billion. Mm -hmm. Our own endowment, excuse me guys, I have my investment people here, is $6 billion. It's a quarter of what's spent on refugees in the world. We have, there is a lot of money. It needs to be mobilized. But I think we can also take um, real inspiration from what the frontline countries have done around Syria. You know, as, as Simon was just saying, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey have taken on tremendous numbers of refugees and they've done really good things, double shifting their schools. Uh, really making economic opportunity possible. And I think we should amplify. We, uh, we should say this is the sort of systems that we should be setting up. Uh, the World Bank has, has started, uh, has eased its lending, so now it can lend to middle-income countries like Jordan, who uh, we all recognize is taking on this big burden. Do you know, I'd love you to highlight the one specific example because the head of the World Bank spoke yesterday mm -hmm. and he, I mean, if, if you were in the room, if you weren't, let me just put it this way, mm -hmm. it was so hopeful hearing him speak. Uh, Jim, Jim, Jim Young, Kim. Kim. Yep. yes, Kim, and a wonderful person who was, he, he hated the banks. He hated the, the World Bank because they, it was going against everything he believed in. He became an activist and boom, he now runs it very <laughs> yeah. successfully. And, your, your and there's a fascinating story about Jordan. Your grandfather's UN, or, uh, World Bank was uh, infrastructure building. Mm -hmm. Now if you ask Jim Kim what are the four priorities of the bank, it's migration, pandemics, climate, and child stunting as, as really the, the, the gateway, reduction in stunting, gateway of, of bringing up the, the capacity of kids. And they're not going deeper and deeper into the black, I mean into the red. They're actually 
making money. Absolutely. And one, one other thing I wanted to bring up, uh, you know, I think we have a real different ways of moving cash around the world than we did in the 1940s. Uh, PayPal, Western Union, MasterCard are all very involved in saying, how can we get money directly to refugees, not through a bunch of cascades? Uh, the same thing to, to local organizations. The, the Georgieva Commission last year found that out of that $25 billion, 0.2% goes to local organizations who are always there, who are trusted, who are efficient. That can, be, that can be raised easily. That's $50 million out of $25 billion. I mean, I would like to harness the business and creative energy in this conference to really be thinking bigger. The, I, I know all the problems we put out here are, are, are daunting, but frankly, the resources in this conference would be, would be entirely adequate to move this a quantum ahead. And if we don't do that, it's like a playing a whack-a-mole game. What we are right. doing right now is we hit it only the last minute. We are doing the, last, the least thing the last minute. And so we're just trying to like hold it from a complete crisis. So what I, what I hear from you, and what I completely agree at least, mm -hmm. we need to be proactive about it. And there are many ways to be proactive. We need to understand the psychology of a refugee. I did a series of interviews on Syrian refugees. Why are you going back to Europe? Why are you taking this boat risk that you could actually die with your family mm -hmm. to make that? And they said the number one reason was dignity that in European countries, and they prioritize the European countries, Germany first, and then it goes to Sweden, and it, it goes uh, by priority, is that they have dignity there. They are given an apartment, a job, a training, money to live for a year, education, all of these things. Well, how about if we replicate what they are looking at in their own countries or in the countries of transition? We can do that in Turkey or in Jordan or in Iraq, all of these things. Second, we need to rebuild the countries not because I am from Iraq, but because I think Iraq is actually where the Pandora's box started of the crisis in the region. The country is destroyed. It's just, I was there a few months ago, and from the front line of my own home that I grew up in to the front lines with ISIS, three hours of drive, every single town, village, city, school, palace, home, store, are not destroyed. They're leveled. They're grounded. Now. If we don't rebuild these countries and not compartmentalize it differently, this is part of the refugee solution. Mm -hmm. If we don't rebuild it and put money there just mm -hmm. so we can actually get the refugees back and make an incentive for them to go back to their countries or to stay in their countries, then we have an everlasting crisis because they want a better life and this is the every person's right. So we need to look at the solutions right now. We are compartmentalizing last minute humanitarian aid, last minute tents, last minute food. We need to step back and revisit this whole strategy of how we look at it. It is, the, I, I believe money is there because it's our invention. Mm -hmm. So we can we can resolve it, but if we don't resolve it, this is this is we can't afford it. This is about is coming by force mm -hmm. to different countries. So we have to be proactive. And I just want to say one thing: the people who are doing the terrorist attacks in Europe are not necessarily refugees. They are not actually refugees. They are immigrants who have been there generations of Europe, generations in Europe, and they are, it's a different story. They're more angry at the claim of equality, justice, and liberty for all. This is much more about discrimination. It's a different story, but they are not refugees. These are, and I've done many stories about them. Their grandfathers fought for the French army in World War I and World War II, all of that. This is a different story. Mm -hmm. And the refugees don't associate with those terrorists who are doing these things. So it's unfair to, to categorize them as one. I'm, I'm glad really you brought that point. Um, Unfortunately, uh, the Syrian crisis became more of an hijacked issue of the Syrian refugee for a political game, whether it was in the United States during the election or in Europe as well. Um, the Syrian refugee are not people that extremists. They are regular people like me and you. They have their jobs, they have their family, they have their entertainment. Uh, going out. I mean, it's a normal human being. As a matter of fact, what really surprised many European leaders is the fact that most Syrian refugees, most, meaning, I mean, almost every family, they have a smartphone. So they are, those people are educated, advanced. But the, the problem is that, to give you scope, Syria is a 23 million in population. Half of the nation is displaced. 
Out of those, you have over 11 million refugees. So if we want to resolve the issue, we need to have the political will to stop the war, like what Simon said. And I think we should speak up to our elected officials and try to push along those lines, because this is going to hurt everyone. And the reason I mentioned that to you is, can you imagine that you have two and a half million children, Syrian children, that are refugee. Those are under the age of 18. So those people did not go to school for six years. And what would you expect a future waiting for those kids where they have seen the horror, the killing, missing their mother, father, sisters? You don't expect them to grow up in a normal behavior. So this is a potential in the future that those people might become an extremist. So the issue of refugee is very important to resolve it while we are addressing how to deal with it. But if we, our, our administration had the will early on to stop it, we wouldn't be here talking about these uh, crises of the Syrian refugee, which is really, we've never seen it in our, uh, in our life. This is the, the, the worst crisis ever in our time. One more point I would like to mention. Uh, 10 years, in the last 10 years, we received close to 150,000 Iraqi refugees mm -hmm. uh, to the United States. And out of those 150,000, there were only five cases for people that associated with some form of terrorism. And out of those five cases, there are three were not uh, charged in terrorism against the US. Rather, they were trying to go to Syria to fight there. So therefore, only two cases that are charged in related terrorism issue against the US. And if you go to any city in the United States, that number is by far exceed the percentage of two out of 150,000. So we need to open our arms to receive the refugees, whether it was Syrian, Iraqis, or the others. And we need to do it on our moral stand, number one. And number two, we need to show the world that since the US is generous in opening its door, uh, its, uh, door to refugees, this will ensure that Canada and other countries to also receive refugees and put an end to all this fear that the media played a very poor job, not in uh, uh, you know, educating people the true factor on, on, on refugees. Oh no, Whether you're going to fake news. <laughs> <laughs> but Canada did accept a lot more refugees, yes. and just in fairness yes. for Canada, now that I'm Canadian, yes. but, but I, you look I, at I, Europe. they are really doing a lot of good jobs. Yes. Yeah. 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 As a matter Absolutely. of fact, Canada could have done more if we didn't have that uh, fear play in the United States and mm. Europe. Mm. Carol, I know you have been nodding in agreement with a lot, and I know you have a lot more to say because you feel working the extent of UNICEF globally is so impressive. And, and like you said, this is much, much bigger than a Syrian refugee crisis. It, it, it is, and I think a couple of thoughts. One, I don't think we anticipated appropriately from the start how big this crisis would become. So even take a country like Jordan and this Atari camp, it was designed for 20,000, I think it's 100,000 people right now. So, you know, the point's taken about we have to start to rethink this. We have to start to think about how do we create employment opportunities there if that's where they're going to be stalled for now. Um, we have to start thinking about the fact that these are children. And your point about the violence, Harvard did an extensive study that proved you get a, an actual physical brain change if you're exposed to repeated and prolonged violence. These children are being exposed to repeated and prolonged violence. We need to ensure that they're not only getting a roof over their head and food in their mouth, but the psychosocial support to ensure that this generation is going to be able to get past what they're experiencing right now. You know, and I'm with these kids, and I, I hesitate every time we say the word refugee because they are not migrants, they are not refugees, they are children. Right. And let's get over the title. True. They are children. And this is not where they want to be, this is not where they ask to be, and we have got to do better by them. And I, and I know because I'm in those camps and I see the face of my own children on every child I deal with. And just by some fortune of luck, 
Mine are being tucked in and they're not. And, I, and then we've got to find a better way. And you're right, this is an opportunity. You have unbelievable, brilliant minds at this conference. We have unbelievable wealth at this conference. We could tackle this problem, and it's not a matter of should we. We must tackle this problem, because we will pay for it in some way, shape, or form, from a security standpoint, from a financial standpoint. We will pay for this. And from a moral standpoint, we will pay for this. And I, I want to. Kind of, I know we're down to the last few minutes, and I will tell you, um, kind of to wrap up, and a couple of you in the room have heard me share this story before, but the thing that gives me hope, that makes me believe that there is a better tomorrow, partially is just the sheer tenacity of the people that we meet in the camps, the women who have been raped, the children who have seen horrors, who still get up every day and think that we're not abandoning them outside of that camp. We're going to do something. And when UNICEF works in the camps, we start very early. And, and why we say UNICEF workers are the elephant walkers, because there's a bunch of kids hanging on you everywhere you go. You know, there's kids that want to hold your hands, and they attach themselves to your legs, and you kind of try to make your way through the day. But there's always a couple of kids who walk behind you, and they, they don't quite make contact with you, but they want to be with you. And, and the last time that I was in the Zatari camp, there was this little boy who walked behind us the whole day. And he, had his, he was about three and a half or four. And he had his sister with him, and she was about 12. And there was a baby. I'm, I never really kind of figured out whether it was a sibling or not, but there was a baby being carried between them. And um, we started at about 7 or 8 in the morning working. We worked all day. It was now about 5 o'clock. We're getting ready to leave the camp. And we realized we hadn't eaten all day, which meant that this little boy who had been following us all day and his sisters had not eaten either. And I was struck by that because I don't know about your kids, but my kids would never let me get past 9 in the morning without breakfast on the table. So I you soon realize this is what life is like for these children. They normally don't eat all day. And we had been in a breastfeeding tent at one point where they gave us these little biscuits. And I don't eat carbs. The other two women with me don't eat carbs. So we had kind of pocketed our biscuits. These biscuits are micronutrient biscuits for the moms, and they wanted us to taste them. So we had palmed our biscuits into our backpacks. And um, so one of the people in our party took her biscuit, and she handed it to this little three-and-a-half-year-old boy. And we just figured he'd you know, quickly run off in a corner and gobble it so that nobody would see, which is what I hate to admit I think one of my own sons would have done. But um, instead, he kind of looked at it for a few minutes. And there were about 20 of us who were workers standing around. And he ripped open the plastic. And he took the biscuit out. And the first thing he did, nobody said anything to this child. He broke it in half. And he handed half to the baby. And we cried. Every single one of us cried. Because if this little child who has nothing knew enough to share that biscuit, what the hell is wrong with the rest of us? And that's kind of my final statement on all of it. <laughs> Beautiful, important statement. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Do we have time for a couple of questions? I wasn't sure if I was getting my first five or my second five. Oh, look at those hands go up. Okay, we have five minutes for questions, and yours was raised first. To the gentleman who talked about the U.S. and fear mongering on the media, why wouldn't Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries open their countries to the non? a Christian refugees or non-minority refugees? OK. Um, ask the Saudis. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not a government official. I am here to address the Syrian crisis from the refugee standpoint. Um, if the Saudis chose to do it or not to do it, it's really their business. I, our organization has, has nothing to do with, with, you know, with any government uh, behavior. Uh, but I do know, and, and a lot of people do ask the questions, why the Saudis don't have a Syrian refugee? And by the way, when we say Syrian refugee, that means not a Muslim only. You have, uh, just to let you know, Syria has the highest number in the world of minorities. I mean, I'm a Syrian origin. And true, honestly, I got to learn of some minorities in Syria that I never knew about after the Civil War. 
So we have the Kildani, we have Christians, many different sect of Christians. We have many different sect of, of uh, uh, Muslims. So, and all of those are refugees. So when I see Lebanon or Turkey or, or Jordan or Saudi Arabia taking Syrian refugee, to me, it's not, suppo it's not necessarily only Muslims. You see what I mean? But I cannot really go further detail because it's not my expertise when it comes to Saudi. But if I may, it's a fair question and it's a different panel on refugees and issues in the Middle East. Um, I think the whole region is very afraid. It's a very fragile stage. There's a lot of wars happening in the region. Not defense, I, I think it's a very fair question. Um, but it's a very different discussion than right now. And I can only say uh, UAE apparently has a highest, the highest, one of, uh, compatible to Norway mm -hmm. and Sweden in terms of the percentage per capita of in humanitarian aids in terms of humanitarian towards the world, but not necessarily in terms of refugees in their own countries. But I think it's a fair, different discussion. I'm happy to take it. And, and just briefly, we did have that pre-discussion last week among us, and we can't solve the political issues. We can't get into, let's go in and stop the war, really. Different topic. Um, but what you said to begin with, Simon, and that is we are still providing aid and a lot of it makes a world of difference. Okay, uh, right back there, Kimberly. Hi, I'm, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Kimberly Marteau Emerson, I sit on the Board of Directors of Human Rights Watch. Mm -hmm. And while I wanna commend all of you for the incredible humanitarian work you do, and I was on the beaches of Lesbos in December of 2015. My husband was the US ambassador to Germany for the last three and a half years, so we, lived through the crisis both in Germany and we, I went to Greece to witness it up front with colleagues from the organization. And I just wanted to say that I think we all, I agree, this conference could help go a long way um, in solving the humanitarian side of this, but I think Zainab said something really important which is, and a couple of you have, we have to get to the root causes we have to get our governments, and we can do this, get our governments to get countries like Russia to stop barrel bombing Syria, because that is what is driving everybody out of the country. And it's not just the chemical weapons attacks. Hundreds of thousands have been killed through normal, indiscriminate bombing. And I just want to say that there's a place for organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and other human rights organizations who actually, this is what they do on a daily basis. They are walking the halls of the UN. They are at the White House. They are at the State Department. They are at the Chancellery in Germany. They are at the EU. And they are doing intense advocacy and, in, and bringing light to issues that are created. And I'll give one example, and then I'll, I'll leave it the floor for somebody else. But, um, the EU-Turkey agreement is not working very well, as we know, those who are in the field. Um, and one of the things that has happened is this intense overcrowding uh, in Greece because um, people are not getting sent back to Turkey because Turkey is not really a safe country for a lot of refugees. And they are getting, they, we discovered children being held in the basements of normal jails um, as a place to shelter them, unaccompanied minors who don't come with families, who are not safe to be in the camps by themselves. So instead they were just sticking them in these very uh, disgusting, unhealthy conditions inside of jails. We, we found thousands of kids being held that way. And we went to the EU with proof of this and they released 120 million euros in order to improve and try to solve this problem. Kimberly, so, I'm, I'm sorry to do I'm gonna this. Pass I'm going to pass on. I'm getting the big rap. You are. Um, so sorry, yes, right. but thank you and uh, thank underscoring you. that we Thanks are. All of you for, thank you all for being here. Thank you for, for pitching in there too. Thank you all for being here. And I hope you walk out the door knowing that um, there is a lot that is being done. There is more that will be done. And I thank all five of you for your passion and your commitment and thank all you. of you for being here. Thank you.